Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, Lake Grove. Welcome. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord. What an amazingly beautiful day. Uh, it's good to have sunshine again. I'm Karen Pergodich. I'm the elder of worship and music here at Lake Grove, and I will have the privilege of assisting in worship today. Uh, today is the fifth Sunday of Lent, uh, and it's a season of lengthening days. Are you adjusted to the new time and enjoying those extra long evenings of sunshine. Um, so I welcome both those of you who are online and worshiping with us at other times during the week, as well as those of you who are here in person. I do have a few things to bring to your attention today for the life of the church. Uh, first, today, uh, immediately after the service, we are going to be meeting in the Fellowship Hall as a part of our Lake Grove Centennial Year, uh, one of our acts of service where we're celebrating 100 years of service with a variety of service opportunities. Today, we're going to be putting together 100 plus hygiene kits for uh, the homeless community that is served by Blanchett House in Portland. So join us right after the service from 10.30 to 11. We'll be putting together those uh, kits and then immediately after that, at 11 this morning, we're going to be having uh, the next in our series of centennial lectures about our uh, history over the last 100 years. So as soon as we're done building the hygiene kits, come over here and we'll have a presentation entitled A Community Church. And you'll hear from Pat Nichols in just a moment, so she'll give you a sneak peek of what you'll hear in today's lecture. And in... Uh, next week, we have one of our favorite traditions, which is Donuts and Donkeys, our second Sunday. Um, we will have uh, donkeys here for Palm Sunday. They will not be walking up the aisle, but they will be in the Jesus Courtyard after the service. Um, so please come ready for a photo op, and donuts, coffee, and fun activities will be set up in the fellowship hall. So we hope you'll stick around to uh, fellowship with people of all ages next Sunday. Uh, during Holy Week, which will be kick, kicked off with Palm Sunday next Sunday, uh, during Holy Week and the week after that, March 26th through 30th, we invite you to the Fellowship Hall for self-directed interactive worship stations that are appropriate for all ages. So for, on Tuesday and Wednesday from 10 to 4, Thursday and Friday from 10 to 7.30 p.m., and Saturday from 9 to 11. Come with your families, with uh, friends with your small group and participate in these self-directed stations. Uh, this is an interactive experience that will offer a time of reflection, prayer, and walking through that last week of Jesus's life on earth. For many years, our congregation has joined the National uh, Church in supporting one great hour of sharing. So every spring around this time, it's one of our quarterly special offerings. It helps the hungry, and it helps develop communities and provides relief during times of natural disaster. So now we're going to watch a video uh, to give us some examples. Don Pedro has always been a farmer, but he hasn't always had a bountiful harvest. The land and climate produce many challenges. So Don Pedro received training to better manage his crops and livestock. Training that your giving to one great hour of sharing made possible. And with that knowledge came light. Now his land and his animals are flourishing. Bananas mangoes, coffee, corn, and more. Pigs, cows, chickens, and goats. And he grows his own grasses to feed all of the livestock with fertilizer he makes from the animals themselves. His family now has food security, even access to clean drinking water. But Don Pedro didn't keep the light to himself. He shared with his fellow farmers and neighbors all that he had learned. And soon the whole community was transformed, harvesting and producing not only all they need to sustain their families, but creating a reliable source of income. Through one great hour of sharing, 
God is transforming the lives of farmers, families, and communities all around the world. And speaking of families, now Don Pedro has more time to share with his. Share the light. Give to one great hour of sharing. Next week, we will be providing special envelopes uh, for you to participate in this offering. Or if you go to the church website, you can find it in the drop down of our online giving. So thanks in advance for making a difference. So now I'd like to invite Pat Nichols to come up and share a little bit about today's centennial lecture, A Community Church. As you just heard, I'm Pat Nichols, and I have been in this church since I was born. Um, in our first history session, we learned how Lake Grove Community Church started in the 1920s, and it took about either 50, 51, or 55 charter members to get this church going. Um, this church has been very important in the, my family's life through my grandparents, my parents, myself, my children. And it all started back when the church was dedicated in 1930. They had two services, one in the morning, thanking all those involved in the building process, and an evening service dedicated to the young people. And all through the history I have read, Sunday School and the young people have been a very important part of Lake Grove. But then came 1929 and the stock market crash and the beginning of the Great Depression. These are words we learned in history, but I never had a feel of it until I went back in my grandfather's ancient files that of course I hadn't looked at until this time and discovered a booklet written in 1934 about what the New Deal was all about, what the Depression did. So come and find out who was on this land before the white man ever got here. What was life like in 1930 for all of the grandparent age people? Who were the charter members? I mentioned there were three different um, numbers. Well, being a curious type person, I went back to the um, original session mi minutes and I sort of solved that problem. Please come and find out more about this church in the very early days. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I'm looking forward to hearing more. So please stand for our call to worship. Daniel was forced to live in a new land with a new culture. He was faithful to God who gave him a special word. He refused to worship idols, putting himself at risk. But because he was faithful, God protected him. Those who were jealous tried to undermine him. Let us also be faithful as we worship the living God. So this morning we'll be singing our opening hymn is a new hymn, a centennial hymn written just for the centennial of Lake Grove Presbyterian Church. We will be singing this again through this year. You can read more about it in your bulletin. But this morning we will just be singing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6, and you'll find that insert in your bulletin.
Lord God, we celebrate your faithfulness to your people in this place for these past 100 years. We thank you for those who heeded your call to proclaim your love and grace to the children and the families of this community in humble ways so long ago. We praise you for your guidance through seasons of joy and stress and strain and for the fruitfulness of ministry in and through this congregation over this past century. We love your church, Lord, and we are grateful to continue to partner with you in your transformation of the world. Amen. Please be seated as we welcome the Peace Choir. Thank you, Peace Choir. Thank you, Abby. Let's come before the Lord in a time of confession. Lord, we want to walk by faith, yet we know how prone we are to wander in our own way. We want to believe that you are near to us, and yet we find that hard in seasons where we cannot see you hear you, or touch you. We want to love others as you love us, yet sometimes that's just really, really hard. We want to confess our sins to you, but sometimes we just don't understand just how far we are from true righteousness, and we don't even notice the things we say or do that may wound others or lead them astray. Lord, whisper to us in our hearts of the broken places you long to heal in us as we confess our sins to you.
Lord, we know that Jesus himself sympathizes with our weaknesses and intercedes on our behalf, praying that we will be forgiven even when we know not what we do. Lord, he is praying that our doubts will be quieted as you help our unbelief, that our ears will be opened so that we can hear your voice, and that our feet will be drawn back to the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. Friends in Christ, see what love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, for that is what we are. All who have this hope in God purify themselves just as God is pure. So let us sing together in response to God's grace. one another as forgiven sinners with the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. You're now invited to share that peace with one another.
Lord, we stand in the shadow of your cross in a land that is weary of suffering. Lord, we are weary of war and of conflict. We decry the slaughter of the Palestinian people in Gaza just as we decry every genocidal holocaust. Teach us to humanize those who are not like us and put an end to senseless violence everywhere. Lord, bring stability and order to the people of Haiti for the consequences of the suffering and the exploitation that has happened there for so long. Lord, we are weary of politics, of lies and half-truths, of scandal and self-righteousness. We're weary of constant pandering for attention through endless media cycles. Lord, raise up leaders of character and judgment and teach us discernment to choose them wisely. Lord, we are weary of illness and of grief, of broken relationships and tormented hearts and minds. Lord, we are exhausted by the demands of just trying to keep putting one foot ahead of the other. Teach us to rest, to heal, and to love. Lord, bring comfort to those who are grieving, particularly the families of Mary Rowling and Jackie Fraze. We pray for our Agros team in Guatemala, strengthen them to serve and to help break the cycle of poverty in the rural communities there. Lord, we offer ourselves to you, what is in our heart and in our mind. We lift this to you in our silence. And now we pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Jeff, did I miss the special hymn that was written just for our centennial? Oh, dang it. We get to sing it again? Good. All right. I'm happy about that. Good morning. Good morning. St. Patrick's Day. Have you? D oh, you're wearing green. Yeah. I didn't tell you anything. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. I've still got my purple, my Lenten purple going. Um, we're in the home stretch of our series on Old Testament forebears who were all in in their relationships with God. We just have one more week after this. This week we look at Daniel, who was in that same general era um, of exile for the Jewish people, um, the era that included Esther last week, Nehemiah the week before that, uh, and Daniel was taken away from Jerusalem probably as a teenager. He was exiled to, to Babylon and with three other faithful young men, he was part of an experiment of integration by King, uh, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. The book of Daniel has 12 chapters in it. Uh, it's clearly divided into two parts. The first six chapters are somewhat biographical, the um, story of Daniel's experience in the Babylonian and Persian cultures, including his ability to uh, interpret the dreams and visions of kings. The second half of the book is very different. Uh, it's about Daniel's own dreams and uh, what he envisions for the future of the cultures he's living in and also the future of Israel. It's considered apocalyptic literature, like the Revelation. So difficult to understand, 
apocalyptic means the uncovering. Uh, we need God's help to uncover them for us. For our purposes today, we're looking at the first six chapters, Daniel's life and example of faith. And I'll leave the interpretation of his visions and prophecy to Susan when she gets back. <laughs> she can do that part. <laughs> the big idea for today is even in a foreign country with different religious practices, Daniel held fast to his faith. He, f he chose to continue to trust Yahweh God, who then used that faithfulness to demonstrate God's own sovereign power and um, also to spread the faith. And I want to do that by surveying what's going on in all six chapters, believe it or not. Um, I'll use ten verbal snapshots to do that, but let's pray first. Let's ask for God's help. Thank you, God, that you have communicated with us in written form through your inspired writers. And will you please open up the story of Daniel for us today so that his example can influence us to be disciples who are all in with you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, a bit from chapter 1, a bit from chapter 6, and we start at verse 1 of chapter 1. Here we go. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord let King Jehoiakim of Judah fall into Nebuchadnezzar's power as well as some of the vessels from the temple, the house of God. These he brought to the land of Shinar and placed the vessels in the treasury of his gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar commanded his palace master, Ashpenaz, to bring some of the Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility, young men without physical defect and handsome, versed in every branch of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and insight and competent to serve in the king's palace, they were to be taught the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the royal rations of food and wine. They were to be educated for three years so that at the end of that time they could be stationed in the king's court. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, from the tribe of Judah. The palace master gave them other names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. We jump to chapter 6. It pleased Darius of Persia to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. Now, um, Kelly Muldoon, you know what a satrap is, don't you? Yeah, I, I know. You know exactly. It's a regional leader. Exactly. You got it right. It's like a governor. So 120 satraps, is that how many it was? Yeah. And they were stationed through the whole kingdom. And over them, three presidents, including Daniel. And to these satraps, to these presidents, the satraps gave account so that the king might suffer no loss. Soon Daniel distinguished himself above all the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to appoint him over the whole kingdom. So the presidents and the satraps, they were jealous. They tried to find grounds for complaint against Daniel in connection with the kingdom, but they could find no grounds for complaint or any corruption because he was faithful. And no negligence or corruption could be found in him we jump to the end of the chapter where it says, This Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And I am saying it's because of his faithfulness to God. And this is the word of the Lord. So, uh, for all you Bible nerds out there, and we all aspire to be Bible nerds, don't we? <laughs> We all aspire to be students of the Bible, lovers of God's word. Let's say for you students of God's holy history, chronologically, Daniel fits right between 
2 Chronicles and Ezra, even though that's not where you find it in the Bible. You know, you can buy a chronological Bible where they, they set it up that way. It's kind of interesting. At the end of the Second Chronicles, we read, Nebuchadnezzar took into exile in Babylon those from Judah who had escaped the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia. And then we learn at the beginning of Ezra that King Cyrus of Persia, who overlapped with Daniel, was influenced by Daniel. He makes the decision to release the Jews so they can go back to Jerusalem. He even helps finance the rebuilding. Daniel's story happens a little before that release. And though I've only given you bits of chapters 1 and 6, I want to span all six chapters in the form of ten verbal snapshots, but focusing on the remarkable loyalty and faithfulness, unfathomable faithfulness, as the title of the sermon says, of Daniel and his three fellow Jews, and the way God uses their faithfulness to demonstrate his own existence, his, his power, and the way he is indeed involved in human history. So let's jump to snapshot one, right off the bat. I call it exiled to privilege. You've got it right there before you, the story that begins in chapter one. King Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem. He steals silver and gold objects from the temple, takes them away, and then he uh, commands a project in my mind, I thought of it as a kind of pre-Third Reich experiment with Jewish captives. Bring me some young men from the elite families, the ones without physical defects, handsome ones with good mental capacity. You know, in World War II, they might have said, you know, the good Aryan boys. And we'll see if they'll be useful in our culture. It was a three-year program. They were to be treated well so that they could be deployed for service in the royal court. We don't know if, uh, how big the program was, uh, whether it was for men only or also for women, but for whatever reason, for God's own reasons, these four young men are singled out. And I, they made it into the Bible, I'm sure, because they were exemplary in their loyalty uh, to the faith that they had been raised in, the faith they knew to be true. One interesting detail, um, again, for Bible nerds, is that they all start out with names that have the, uh, a, a form of the name of God in them. Either El, meaning high, the high God, or Yah, which is part of Yahweh, the, the personal name of God as it was conveyed to Moses at the burning bush. So we have Daniel, Daniel, and we have Mishael, and then we have Hananiah, and Azariah. So God's name is in these four guys, but when they get to Babylon, they're given Chaldean names, also with the names of false gods in them. They become uh, Bel Teshazar. Bel is a false god. Uh, Akko is another one. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, yet a third uh, foreign god. So snapshot one is that these boys are abducted and they're put into this experimental program and they're treated well. Snapshot two, I call eating kosher, eating healthy. The young men in this test program are to be fed the finest food from the royal menu and also served with plenty of wine. But if you read the rest of chapter one, you'll learn that Daniel asked that he and his friends be excused from the Babylonian cuisine, presumably so that he could eat, they could eat in accordance with their own religious laws, a sign of their faithfulness. Um, they'll eat vegetables only, that's what they ask. Then they don't have to worry about whether they're getting kosher meat or not. And they say, no wine, thank you. Uh, the Babylonians wonder about this, uh, but Daniel says, well, let's just let, it tr let us try it for 10 days, and if we do well, fine. Otherwise, we'll go back to the royal menu. And they do thrive. Thanks be to God. And the king notices. And he starts tracking with them. 
God blesses their faithfulness and they rise to the top of the experiment of integration. Snapshot three, helping them to continue to rise, God grants the interpretation of dreams and visions, part one. In chapter two of the book, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has some troubling dreams and he asks all his wise men and none of them can even tell him what the dreams are, let alone what they're about. Um, but Daniel boldly says, how about letting me try? And I say boldly because there's no evidence that he's able to do this. In fact, he frantically contacts God, starts praying and says, help me, help me do this. He asks his buddies to plead with God for help. He trusts God and God comes through. Daniel is able to tell Nebuchadnezzar what his dreams were about and then also what they meant. And uh, the king is amazed and he promotes Daniel and his friends, starts giving them more and more responsibility. And they start having more and more jealous rivals. And that brings us to snapshot four, the fiery furnace fails. Everybody knows Daniel has the story of the fiery furnace. You remember the king had this golden statue built 100 feet high very impressive. They rolled it around Babylon with the requirement that anyone who sees it must bow down before it and worship it. And if they don't, they will be burned to death. That's the penalty. But our boys from Judah, they don't worship idols. They worship only the one true God. And they don't care about punishment. Verses 17 and 18 of chapter 3 tell us This is what they say. We won't worship the golden statue. And in fact, we won't worship any of your gods. And if you try to burn us, we trust that our true God is able to deliver us. And you remember what happens. They're thrown into an extra hot, fiery furnace. But the flames do not harm them. And strangely, and this is the three. This is only the three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But when... They look into the fiery furnace. They see four people in there. Who was that fourth person? Was it Daniel? Uh, Was it an angel? Was it Jesus? Some people say. Who knows? But in any case, the king is amazed and he issues a new decree. No more golden statue. Instead, his people are going to honor the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And those three are promoted again. So the faithfulness of these three young men and Daniel is leading to growing responsibility and also influence. Fifth snapshot. This is a brief one that says something about Nebuchadnezzar, from privilege to poverty to paradise. That's what I call it. Nebuchadnezzar has other dreams for for Daniel to interpret. They're complicated. The interpretation is not always positive for Nebuchadnezzar, and it's so confusing to him that he loses his mind, literally. He goes crazy. He runs away from the palace. He goes and lives off the land. He becomes like an animal. That's how he's described. But in the end, he comes to his senses. He repents. He remembers the God of Daniel and his friends, and he ends up praising that God before he dies. So their example has made a difference in the life of Nebuchadnezzar himself. Snapshot six, God interprets, God God grants interpretations of visions and dreams, part two, because now Nebuchadnezzar's gone, but his son is in power. Belshazzar is his name, not Belteshazzar like Daniel, but Belshazzar. He's ruthless, he's self-indulgent, He's faithless. He doesn't care about his subjects and he doesn't care about God. He is the kind of leader who demands human adulation. And if you are not on his side, if you do not worship him, then he's going to retaliate and get you. Um, That's a primitive kind of attitude that fortunately we don't expect from our modern leaders. In the middle of a huge party, wine flowing freely, This evil king sees a hand, a disembodied hand, writing on the wall, writing words. That's where we get our 
are saying the writings on the wall. And Daniel interprets the meaning to the detriment of Belshazzar, that's judgment for him, and in fact, he dies that very night. Babylon then falls to the Persian Empire, but Daniel and his friends are in such positions of importance, and they are untainted by this bad king, so they continue to serve under Cyrus and Darius, maintaining their integrity and trusting God during the new empire, the Persian Empire. And they are promoted, and there's growing envy and, and uh, rivalry for them. This part is from the chapter 6 that we, we read. The Persian emperor organizes his kingdom with these regional leaders. And Daniel, by God's grace, because of his religious integrity, rises to the top. Some of the Persian nationalists don't like this. Uh, why should this foreigner be in charge of us? So they set a trap. They pass a law that says only the head of state may be worshipped. Um, and of course, for our Jewish friends, they only worship Yahweh. Daniel will never worship the king. In fact, the language tells me that when he hears about the new law, he immediately goes and starts his daily Jewish prayers in public. And his rivals catch him. He is arrested. And what happens to him? He's thrown into the lion's den. Somebody knows it. There's about there's a handful of Bible nerds out there. He's thrown into the lion's den. And King Darius is sad about this. He, he's sad that he was duped into making this stupid law. He likes, Daniel has been very valuable to him. He's horrified that he's going to face this, this punishment. He even prays all night for Daniel's deliverance. And the next morning he rushes over to the lion's den to see what's happening. And Daniel is alive. The lions have left him alone. And Daniel says, it's because God could find no fault with me. And so God sent an angel to, to protect me. Once again, the Persian emperor, like Nebuchadnezzar before him, is so impressed that he makes a statement it leads to our next to last verbal snapshot. It's because of the power of positive example. Because the unfathomable faith and courage of Daniel and the divine inter intervention that tamed the lions, God's activity here, these caused Darius to praise the God of Daniel and to demand the same of all his people. Darius says, for Daniel's God is the living God, enduring forever, his kingdom shall never fail, shall never be destroyed. He delivers and rescues. He has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. And that's why at the end of those, those first six chapters, faithful Daniel ends up prospering through the end of the reigns of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian, as we read. And that brings us to the final snapshot. Number 10. Number 10 has not been taken yet. That snapshot's not been taken. Uh, because it's a picture from your life and mine. And it will be taken today or later this week. And it will reveal, it will show how we demonstrate the kind of all-in faith we have seen in Daniel and in Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or you know them more as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We, how will we respond not to a foreign culture, but to the pressures of our own culture, to the pressures not to be faithful to God, to idols that are not 100-foot golden statues, but they're different idols that come from our peers and our society and our own uh, desires. They lure us away from a committed and satisfying uh, relationship with God through Jesus Christ. They distract us. They get us on tra off track. And so my prayer is that the example of these faithful young Jewish men in Babylon, in, in Persia, that they will cause us to pause and reflect 
on our own lives and build an intentional plan that allows us to hold fast to our best principles, the ones we've learned in our walk with Jesus Christ. Um, that we will, yes, to thine own self be true, that's fine, but to God be true is even better. To be faithful like Daniel, to hold our integrity in the truth that we, as we understand it with God, so that, like with Daniel, God may use our examples, our integrity, for his sovereign purposes. I believe that even in an evolving, sometimes anti-Christian culture, like our own, that we can still hold fast to our trust in Yahweh God so that God can use our integrity to demonstrate his own existence, his power, and his work in our world. And that will spread the faith. May it be so in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and sing God's praises. lavished your loving generosity on us. Teach us to entrust those resources back to you. We pray for the fruit of these offerings in our church, in our community, and in our world. We pray for Loving's ongoing support of Clackamas County families in need, and for the director, Stuart Smith, as he guides this vital ministry. Lord, we pray for the ministries of the Way of Righteousness Church in St. Louis, Senegal, that their gospel outreach to the Wolof people continues to be effective. Lord, we dedicate these gifts to you and ask you to multiply them for your kingdom. Amen.
reminder, uh, kit build, hygiene kit build in the courtyard room. You can just take five minutes and you're doing something good for somebody through Blanchett House. And then at 11 o'clock, come back here for more stories about the early days of our church. We stand on the shoulders of faithful, faithful people. And now, because it is that day, I have words by way of benediction from the prayer of St. Patrick. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through a belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of Christ's birth and his baptism, through the strength of his crucifixion and his burial, through the strength of his resurrection and his ascension, through the strength of his descent for the judgment of doom. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me. May we rise today through the mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through a belief in the threeness, through a confession of the oneness of the creator of creation in Jesus Christ. And let all God's people say together, 